For all the singing, all the, the choir, the special music, what a blessing to have all that, that talent right here at the church. That's a mm -hmm. blessing that a lot of churches don't have, so we thank the Lord for that. Well, we have the Word of God this morning. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7, I want to share a few thoughts with you here on the passage of Scripture. I hope it will be a blessing to you and help you. 2 Kings chapter 7. Second Kings is right after First Kings. <laughs> Amen. If you go to Third Kings, you've gone too far. Go back. <laughs> Second Kings, chapter seven. Amen. Second Kings, chapter seven. Word of God says. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in the gate of Samaria. Now, the background on here is that they're under siege <laughs> by the Syrian army, and they're being starved out. There's not uh, any animals much left. They've ate then, and they're running out of food. And that's the way armies did back then. They didn't necessarily fight all the time, but they would just lay siege on a town and starve it out. A very cruel way of destroying the people. And they're starving. Now the background here, let me just read what kind of situation we're in. Let me build this up for you, and then we'll get right back to chapter 7. Now chapter 6, in verse 24, it says, And it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. Now Samaria is northern Israel. So when it says Samaria, they're talking about uh, the Hebrews. They're talking about the northern kingdom there of Israel. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver. Now, that's 80 pieces of silver for a donkey's head. Uh, they hungry. And they'll pay anything to get something to eat. And it says... And the fourth part of a cab of doves done for five pieces of silver. Now, I don't think I have to tell you what that is. Uh, but they were willing to pay for it to eat. And so they're starving, okay? It's a very serious situation here. They're in a great famine. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? He says, look, I'm starving too. And if God don't help you, no help's coming because I sure can't help you. And the king said unto her, what ail it then? She answered and said, this woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him. Today we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him and said unto her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard these words of the woman that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Now you'll notice that she wasn't mad that she ate a young, and she was just mad that she couldn't eat the other one's young. Now, they've gotten depraved. They've been in a famine long enough until they've allowed wickedness uh, to enter in, and they'll do anything and everything because the man's heart is deceitful. You realize that. It's wicked. And when push comes to shove, it'll do what it's supposed to do. And that's wickedness. That's what your flesh loves to do. And it's a sad commentary on what's going on uh, in this time that we're reading. But then it said that God, the king said, God, do so and more also to me if the head of Elijah, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. Now Elijah is the preacher. <coughs> and because all this is going on, Let's, bring, let's blame the preacher. Okay? That's what he's saying. Now, Elijah is the only one uh, that's prophesying and telling them these things and telling them to repent and straighten up their life. And so the messenger is often shocked over the message. I see that a lot. Uh, you see that a lot. Uh, you've got a message as a Christian. But let's blame the Christian for all that's going on in the world. That's right. That's right. And that's what you see in the day. That's right in the United States. And don't think that the United States couldn't get in this bad shape. 
We're just so blessed and got it so good and we're so unthankful we don't think it's ever going to end. That's our problem. And so, uh, there's about to be a great deliverance here. And then when we read verse 1, Elijah said, listen here, this thing's fixing to be over. God's going to come down and you're going to be able to buy fine flour and all the food you want for nothing. Just a minuscule amount of money. And when he tells him that, then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned, uh, on verse 2, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat there. Okay, so the king said, hey, This ain't going to happen, Elijah. There's no way this can happen. There's no way there's going to be all this bread for us to come and eat. And Elijah said, Sure, it's going to happen tomorrow. And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. And if we shall, we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they shall save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Now that's a very interesting conversation they're having about death, isn't it? And they come to the conclusion that there's a lot worse things that can happen than death. You know what the conclusion they come to? You know what it said? It said, listen, we're going out there, and if they kill us, we should but die. They said, it's worse than death. We just soon go out there and take our chances. Because there's a lot of things worse than death. Amen? Some of y'all aren't saying that, but there is a lot of things worse than death. Especially for the Christian. He just dies and goes to hell. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they would come to the uttermost part of the camp of the Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made a, uh, the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel had hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, and even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into the tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and rain and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. When they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called them to the port of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither the voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd help me this morning. God, I pray you'd help me to say that, what you'd have me to say, nothing else. God, I don't want to say anything that you wouldn't want me to say. God, I pray you word it. Go out and work and move and, uh, amongst these folks and amongst my heart, Lord Father. I pray you'd open my heart. First and foremost, Lord, I pray you'd work right behind this pulpit, Lord, and preach me this morning. God, I pray you'd do something special here this morning. You save some soul, release some folks from bondage. God, just work your will in people's lives this morning. Help us, Lord. And we'll thank you. And we'll praise you for what you're going to do. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> what an interesting story there. A story that's terrible to even think about that a place would get that bad of shape. But I want you to pay attention there as we read there in verse 3 that these four lepers were sitting there and they asked this question. And I want you to mark this in your habit of marking your Bible. Why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? Now you think about it. Now these folks have realized that they have the sin, the condition of leprosy. And leprosy is uh, it's a death warrant. That you're going to die. If you get leprosy, it doesn't matter if you've got it full blown or just a little patch. It's eventually going to get you. It's eventually going to spread. And you're going to die. And so they're having this conversation about death. And sin uh, is pictured by this leprosy. Okay, always in the Bible when you see a leper, 
uh, spiritually is pointing back to being a sinner because leprosy has so much to do with sin, so much in common, so many parallels there. So you're with me on that. You see the leprosy? It represents sin, like many things do. Many physical, actual things in the Bible represent things spiritually. And that's how we learn, and that's how the Bible teaches us most often there as we read the Old Testament, especially the shadows in here. Now you'll notice that we find these four lepers that are have a death warrant on them. They're as good as dead. They're on middle ground, aren't they? You notice that? They said, we, we're right here at the gate, and we can't go this way because there's death over here. And if we sit right here, we know we're going to die. But there's something out there. We're not sure what's out there. But there's a little bit of hope in these four lepers' life that there's something out there that might save them. Are you with me on that? There's something out there. <laughs> they don't know exactly what's out there, but they're thinking and hoping that there's something out there that might save them. And they're in that middle ground right now. And they look at one another and they say, look, what, what are we doing here? We're just sitting around dying. We need to do something in our lives. They're on this middle ground. They're saying, why don't we just do something? Why don't we just do something? And you know, that's the way it is in church service a lot of times. Uh, many people in here are saved and going to heaven. And I'm glad of that. But there's certainly a few in here uh, right now that's just sitting, sitting on a pew. And they can't go back in life. There's nothing back there we can go to. And they don't know exactly sure how to go forward. And they know if they're sitting right there, they know they're sinners, they know they're dying and going to hell. And they leave uh, after an hour of service. And through the whole service, they just sit there. They're on that middle ground. Kind of straddling the fence ground. Won't they do something? I mean, if you knew that you were dying and there was hope out there, wouldn't you go out there and try to get hope? Wouldn't you go out there and try to get healed? Why don't somebody do something? And the Christian's the same way. Uh, we're all over the board. Uh, it doesn't matter who you talk to. We can get together and complain about a lot of things. Now, I know y'all don't complain. <laughs> and I don't complain. I'm talking about other churches and other folks that complain. Oh, how rotten our schools are. Why don't you do something? Why don't somebody do something? That's right. People complain about abortion. Why don't somebody do something? Then you want somebody to do something. Yeah. Talk about all these babies being killed. Want somebody to do something? Why are we just sitting here? Right. Are we just come on Sundays and we just sit here? Nobody wants to do anything to see somebody get saved, see a life change. Want somebody to do something? Want somebody to get up and do something? Just sit around. Christians, lost people, death all around us. This is a very dark scene. Want somebody to do something? Finally, they say, we're going to do something. we got to do something. You know what they did? The Bible says, by faith, they rose up. Isn't that what they did? They decided to do something. They didn't exactly know what was out there, but the Bible says that they rose up and went to the camp. They just by faith. So we're going to rise up and do something. Why don't we rise up by faith? Amen. And do something this morning. That's what they did. They went and came to the camp by faith. That's the only way they could do it, is by faith. That's the only way you can get saved, right? Mm -hmm. By faith. Yes. You can talk about things. You can talk about God. You can talk about Jesus all day long. Listen, you can even believe that there was a literal Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Sure you can. There's something specifically that has to happen when you think about Jesus Christ. You must take your faith that He died for you, uh, this, that you're talking about, the Gospel, that He died, that He bled, that He rose again and lives forevermore. Uh, it's more than just talking. It's more than feeling. Your faith must be exercised. You must put your faith in Jesus Christ. When you do that, you exercise your faith. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't, it's just not a feeling. There has to be something along with it. It's just like when I, in the mornings, I go crank my Ranger up. If anybody wants to buy that, it's for sale. <laughs> you see it out there in the parking lot. But every morning, I exercise my faith because I believe that car is going to crank. I go out there. 
I throw my flip-flops on, and sometimes I got my shorts on, and I run out there because it's 22 degrees, and I'm gonna go out there and crank it and let it warm up. And by faith, I believe that car's gonna crank. But you know, sometimes my faith in that thing is put in the wrong thing because I have been out there before. <laughs> and I heard it go click, 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 click. But I had faith to go out there and try it, didn't I? But that car let me down. <coughs> the only thing that your faith is good for, really, is in Jesus Christ. Because it's going to never let you down. It'll never let you down. It'll never let you down. you got to exercise your faith. These men could have talked about what was out there. They could have dreamt about what was out there. They could have wondered what was out there. But they exercised the faith. The Bible says they rose up. And you notice they rose up at twilight. <coughs> Twilight's an unusual time, isn't it? It's an unusual experience, twilight. And, and twilight is, is unusual in the fact that uh, twilight happens when it's darkness all around you. Okay? Twilight happens at night. Okay? Uh, so darkness is all around you, and yet there's still enough sun, there's still enough light to have just a smidgen to guide you. You ever been out in twilight? You ever been out in a night where you can see enough to be guided just a little bit? Because really what happens there is, although it's completely dark, the sun still beats across the moon. And the moon reflects just enough light. <laughs> I want to tell you in dark times, we need some moons out there. Because we've got the sun. And you know the moon just reflects the light of the sun. It's got no light of its own, right? right, right, right. And boy, if we just let some twilight go in our life. Because we're living in a dark time. There's darkness all around us. But boy, if we'd be a little light. If we'd be a little twilight. They didn't, listen, it was a dark time for those lepers. And listen, there wasn't much chance for them. But there was just a little light. It was twilight. And by twilight, that twilight, you know what it done? It guided them to the camp. <laughs> the light in the middle of darkness guided them to their salvation. I wonder how many of us would be twilight in this dark time. <clears throat> just enough light. Anyway, listen, it wasn't daytime. It just took a little light. Just think about that. The sun, they couldn't see the sun. It was just reflecting off the moon and giving them just enough light to find their salvation. You know, I've just preached to you just enough light. Save every soul in here. In fact, I've just given you enough light for everyone in the sign of my voice could be saved. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Amen. And so it was twilight, but they had enough light in that dark time to go out to the camp. And you notice when they went out to the camp, there was no man there. Isn't that what it says at the end of verse 5? God said, this is all the work of me. There's not a man out there to give them a hand of anything. There's no man out there to do the work. It was just God. There was no man out there. Do you notice this? That as we read ahead, those lepers didn't know it. But when they acted on faith, and we know it because we were able to read ahead, God had already done a great miracle while they were sitting there dying. Did you, did you get that? <laughs> well, you did because you would have said amen. Jumped down and done some push-ups or something. I mean, they were dying. And while they were dying, God had already done the miracle and was just waiting for them to come to the camp. People dying all over needlessly because they just sit there. And more, more importantly, people dying all over because we just sit there. We just sat and said, I want somebody to do something. Listen, the miracle was already done. Listen, they were talking about death. They were talking about their hopelessness. They were talking about starving. And little did they know, God had already made salvation. He'd already made a plan for them. Right. Amen. There's people all over dying. <coughs> they had no idea that God done did a great miracle for them. That's right. You know why? Because there's not no twilight in their life. They, in, they're in darkness. But even in great darkness, on twilight could guide them to the camp. There's already a miracle done. They just do something. 
Do you notice that the lepers there, we read there in verse 8, what they come to? The Bible says that they came to the uttermost part of the camp. Do you notice that? They didn't go, have to go into stages to get salvation. Do you notice that? They didn't have to go to the center of the camp or even in uh, maybe it had so many feet in the camp, but it says they went to the uttermost parts of the camp. You know what that means? They just went to the fringe of the camp. You know what we mean on that, okay? They just went to the skirt. Let me put it this way. They just went to the border of the camp. And if you go to the border of the camp, you get it all. Let me... Wake up. There's a woman one time. <laughs> and listen, she'd been sick all those years and spent all that she had. And she had an issue of blood. And she come up behind a, a man walking with the disciples and all she could touch was just a border of his garment. She, listen, she didn't give him a big hug. She didn't do anything else. She just touched the hem, so to speak, of his garment. Amen. And she was made whole. Amen. You just get the hem of the camp and you get it all. <laughs> they got all the bread. They got all the wine. They got all the silver. And anything by going to the uttermost, the fringes, just the border, just the hem of the camp. If you just touch the hem of the garment, you get all of Jesus. Amen. There's no such part. Listen, there's no parts of Jesus. It's either all or nothing. You get Jesus, you get it all. You get saved, you get saved, you get it all saved. Well, he's a little saved. He's half saved. What? <laughs> I've never seen anybody dead that wasn't all the way dead. That's right. <laughs> I've been, listen, I've been to Jamie Bowles I don't know how many times at funerals. I've seen I don't know how many visitations. And people laying around there. And it don't matter if there's one here, one there, one there, nobody. I've never heard anybody say, well, he's just part dead. We're just waiting. <laughs> no, he's all dead. You've never trusted Jesus Christ. You all did. And if you get a hold of Jesus Christ, you all saved. Amen. You're not part saved. It's not something you're going to lose. It's not coming in degrees of spirituality or anything like that. Listen, just come to the uttermost part of the camp and just touch the fringes and you get everything. All the silver, all the gold. You just have to touch the fringes. And you know, it's back then when they were talking. They said the worst thing that could happen is maybe they'll just kill us and it'll be over. And if we die, we die. But if not, maybe they'll show mercy on us and give us some scraps. Or maybe they'll do something for us. In other words, they had a little, just enough faith and just enough hope to say, listen, if we just give anything, we'll be glad. But what did they do when they got there? They got there. Got all, didn't they? they got, you know what they got? They got exceeding and abundantly above what they thought they was going to get. Listen, when I got saved, I, I, I'm going to show you how spiritual I was. When I got saved, the biggest thing that was on my mind was, God, I don't want to go to hell. I look at you all spiritual now. And you live in the elevated life. You just want it all, wouldn't you? Not me, man. I just, I'm scared to death. They are preaching. I think about them flames, boy, how sweat and drops of blood. Sweat. Oh, man. How scared I was. I said, won't go ahead. And once I got saved, I found out he done way more than that. Yeah. Right. Man. I found out through the years. Yeah, listen, I've gotten it all. I've gotten just so much money. Listen, if it was just getting out of hell, it'd be worth getting saved for, wouldn't it? Yeah. But look, I got so much more than that. I got it all. After I got saved, I got His sweet spirit in me. And nobody else. Listen, when, listen. When I'm so mad and mean and, and terrible and pouting, not even Jamie wants to come over and give me a hug. <laughs> I can't tell you, there's one that'll come put his arms around. Amen. Yeah. Say so it's all right. It's gonna be all right. Thank you, Jesus. When everybody walks out. I found that he'll stay right there with 
I got so much more. It's, it's more than I ever dreamed I was going to get once I got it. They said, man, look at this. I bet they was laying around there, David, in them tents, jawing down on some old chicken leg or something. Like a man look like kings. They lived like kings. Just by touching a friend, the uttermost part. They got exceeding more than they thought they'd get. Here comes a problem. Man. They got to laying there, walling around and all that gold and silver. One of them said, we don't do well. We don't do well, fellas. Did you know when the rebel, listen, you know, you don't do anything to get saved except trust in Him. By faith, you come to Him and He saves you by His grace. Not of works, lest any man boast. But I'm going to tell you something, after you get saved, there's obligation. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Listen, if you're not listen, if you're not a new creature, if there's not new desires. Listen, after you get saved, you still gonna sin. Sorry. It's all right. It's just the way it is. You carry this old flesh with you. When I got saved, though, I got new desires. I got a new yearning to do things I never had before. I, I got uh, listen. Uh, I, I, there was a new obligation in my heart where I wanted to serve Him and please Him. Not because I was trying to earn my salvation, but because He had saved me and changed my life. And because of what He's done for me, that means there are obligations. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. That's what Jesus said in Yes. Obligation. His obligation. He said, we've got, we got an obligation to tell somebody. He said, we've got good tidings. And we're not telling anybody. I wonder how many of us say this week we had good times. We got a story to tell. We got some good news to spread to all those folks back there that were starving and in the famine. And we're sitting here living like kings in a good life. He said, we're not doing well. We need to go tell somebody. That dirty ain't. Wouldn't that be dirty? That them boys? Now they've been done dirty. They receive a raw deal. Listen, you got leprosy, you got put out the camp. You got thrown out there by yourself, and that was it. You got no touching, no loving, no nothing. Listen, you didn't get no family, no nothing. The only thing people might do is throw you some scraps. <coughs> yeah, even those lepers knew we're not doing right. If you were sick and about to die, and I had the information that could save you, and I kept my mouth shut, what kind of person do you say I would be? Y'all run the preacher down with me. You say, he's a scoundrel. That's what we do, though, isn't it? We got the life saving information. We got good tidings. And we don't do well, because you know why we don't tell nobody. How many people talk about Jesus this week? Mm. Well, it hurts, don't it? Look in the mirror come Sunday morning, you're ready to worship and go to church, and you want God to do something in your life. You expect, listen, you look in that mirror that morning, you think back that week, you say, you know what? I ain't told nobody my good tidings. Listen, if your little baby was sick and you knew that I had the very information that could save you, you're holding that little baby in your hands and it's, it's sick to death. That sweet little baby, that sweet little young of yours, and the preacher's got all the information. Brad had all the information, everything it would take. You could go get a cure for your baby. <laughs> and you find out that baby died and later you find out I knew about that and I didn't tell you what would you say about me you say you're a scoundrel wouldn't you wouldn't you say I was a scoundrel I think you would I would With my little coopy over here <laughs> somebody knows some information that help him God help him he needs it y'all didn't tell me and I found out you knew about it we well, see one mad man. But every week we do that. And don't tell me that's, a, that's exaggerating, that's hyperbole. No, it's not. That's exactly what we're doing. Exactly what we're doing. In fact, I submit to you this morning, it's worse. It's worse. Because what we're holding back is last for eternity. Last for eternity. We've got a plan! We sing about a Savior has been born. We celebrate with the gifts under the tree. And we've got the greatest gift in the world, the greatest glad tidings in the world. And we do not well because we have.
hide our glad tidings and we don't tell anybody. Verse 9 says, you know what? When the conscience got to him, he said they got up and went to the king's household. He said, hold up. we got some good news. You know what they said to him? It doesn't say exactly what he said, but I believe he said, look, we got all the bread you need. <laughs> he said, y'all still starving in there? Y'all still dying in there? He's probably carrying the bodies out when they got to the wall, throwing them over the wall. They said, hey, we got all the bread you could ever have. And ever eat to your heart's desire right <laughs> over there in the camp. Come on with us. Let me close with this. Boy, I went over. I'm sorry. I used to go over. I've tried to be brief. Can I finish up? Can I tell you one more thing? No, let's sing. We're going to sing tonight. We're going to have a sing tonight. Rochester, they're probably going to be surprised they want me to play with them. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm gonna have to turn them down. Let them have. I won't show off. <laughs> That's a joke. Y'all ain't never been in this church before. Y'all are probably gonna come back. <laughs> Verse 17. I'll close with this. Remember that old boy over there who said, "This thing, God opened up the doors of heaven." Elisha said, "Tomorrow you're gonna see the famine's gonna be over with." And the king's assistant, who he leaned on. Went up to Elijah. I bet he got in his face and said, Elijah, if the wind is ahead of us, no. That never happened. You know what Elijah told him? He said, you're going to see it. <laughs> but you're not going to get it. He said, you're going to see it. But because you've not got faith to receive it, you're not going to get it. Verse 17. When we didn't read over there. It says, And the king appointed the Lord appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. And so you can imagine when they told him they had all the bread they wanted out there, what happened? Right? It's a stampede. No boys in the gate. The Bible says the people trod upon him in the gate and he died. Just as the man of God had told him. I've given you glad tidings this morning. Just like Elijah did. I've given glad tidings this morning. Elijah was clear. And I'm clear. And you're clear. I gave you glad tidings this morning of good news about all the bread you ever want to eat to save your life. But he wouldn't take it by faith. And the good news became judgment upon him. Isn't that what it is? Jesus is either lie. Or he's dead, isn't he? You're either going to accept that good news and receive that bread, or you're not, and you're going to die. He's either going to be your Savior, or you'll stand before him in judgment. Why will somebody do something? I mean, why are we standing around on, why are we sitting around on pews, and why are we just why don't somebody do something? Why don't somebody do something? Why I sit here until we're all dead? Why don't somebody get up and do something? I wonder if we stink. <coughs> Amen. We'll get a hymn. What's a hymn? What's a lady? Look over there. I'm not going to come in. Set 289, 189. Why don't somebody do something? Maybe you're dying this morning on the pew. You're not sure you know Jesus. Why are you doing that? Why don't somebody do something? Maybe God's called you to do something. You, 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 why don't somebody do something? Why are we just sitting around? Why are we holding glad tidings? Let's sing a couple verses. Maybe you just need to come and say, I need to do something. I don't even know where to start. Why don't you start down here at this altar? So I just need to do something. I at least pray for somebody. Maybe you know somebody's dying in your family. Why don't you do something about it? Why are you just sitting there letting them die? Why aren't you praying for them? Why aren't you coming to the altar and saying, Oh, God, be merciful to that 
Paul said, why don't somebody do something for somebody? Why are we just sitting around dying? Why don't we do something? Why don't we do something? Why don't somebody just do something? Do you know it? We'll just sit there and you do something. By faith, rise up and say, I'm, I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to sit here and die. I'm not going to sit here.